This afternoon is, <clears throat> is like um, an afternoon of meetings with remarkable women. Uh, Adud, um, just before we talk, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, one of fashion's most seductive synchronicities is that between model and moment. I think of Twiggy or Varushka or Linda, Vrand, Linda, Evangelista, or Linda Evangelista or Kate Moss, uh, where the model defines the moment so perfectly that she becomes something more. I think this is Adut's moment for sure. But it's so interesting to be um, with her and to be participating in a talk that she has called I will always be a refugee. And obviously that is uh, an irresistible point to start our talk. So, Adut, why will you always be a refugee? <laughs> okay, well, could I first start off by saying good afternoon, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, it is an absolute honor to be in this room filled of such inspirational people for the past two days. I've been listening to many stories and many people and every time I have left this room I have felt so inspired and I've obtained so much knowledge and things that I had no idea about before. Um, so thank you to each and every one of you guys that have shared your stories and have taught me something. Um, it's, it's crazy to be here. Um, it's my first time speaking in front of a lot of people. I'm not really good with public speaking, so when I... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when I first found out that I had made the list of the BOF 500, I was blown away because I had known about business of fashion, I followed them, and never ever did it cross my mind that I would be one of the 500 people who's making some sort of positive impact within the fashion industry. Um, when I found out, when my agent told me about the gala in New York City, I, I asked her, I was like, how and why, why me? So when I attended the gala, I met Imran for the first time, and I remember asking him, why me? <laughs> and he said, um, for the past year, I've been following your journey, and you are so inspiring. And I was like, if I can inspire someone like Imran, that proves that I can not only inspire models, but I can inspire so many different people from different fields of the industry. Um, from various industries, um, and then he asked me about my story, and I told him about it, and and here I am today. <laughs> found out about voices, and as nervous as I was, because I, I don't usually speak in front of a lot of people, I was so excited because, you know, I get to be here and share with you guys about my story, and it's just such an absolute honor. So now, <laughs> we're going to get Why will you this. always be a refugee? Why will I always... I will always be a refugee because that's who I am. Um, like I've mentioned before, no matter, you know, no amount of money or my status or how famous or whatever the case is, I'm always going to be a refugee and I am proud of who I am and, you know... That's why I always say I'm always going to be a refugee. That's being a refugee, I guess. I don't know, like I said. Does, it's does that mean you feel like you belong nowhere? Or do, or do you feel I, feel... I feel like I belong everywhere, really. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's the answer. I do. I feel like anywhere in the world is a home for me, and I belong. Because before when we were talking, I, I, I wondered what your earliest memory was. Because you've lived very distinct lives. Yes, I have. Um, so quite surprisingly, I have a pretty good memory of, um, you know, when I was younger in the camp. Um, as, you know, some of the best memories I have is just being a child. I didn't know I was in a refugee camp. It never felt like I was in a refugee camp. You know, I had my cousins there and I had friends and... Some of the best memories was just running around and being a child and playing, you know, not worrying about anything. And then there was, you know, the terrifying memories. I'm like four and, you know, 
um, being a four-year-old, you don't really understand what's going on, but, you know, you have some sort of gut feeling or sense that something is not right. And I remember there would be times where, um, you know, my family and my relatives and people around me would be scared because, you know, they would be... They thought that there was people coming to come and kidnap their kids and kill us and all of this. So, you know, our families would be packing up and we would all get in groups and try and stay together. And I, I never bothered to ask what was going on, but I knew that something wasn't right. So it was, you know, as I have those good memories, I also have them terrifying memories that, you know, I wish that no child ever has to feel and... Because your family was split up, weren't they? Yes. Um, so my family, when I was born, I was born in South Sudan, my family was fleeing war, um, and then they landed in Kakuma refugee camp where I grew up, and, um, you know, Kakuma was my first home. And, you know, some of my family is still back in South Sudan right now. I have family in Kakuma, I have family in Nairobi, I have family in South Sudan, I have family everywhere around the world. So, yes, we were split up, but um, I guess we... But how, and how did you get from Kenya to Australia then? Because um, it seemed you ended up in Adelaide in Australia, which seems quite random, except it wasn't, was it? No. Um, so my auntie um, actually first went to Australia with my older sister, and they started a visa process for um, my mother and my younger sister. Um, and my older cousin. And the visa process was a whole lot easier because my sister had a mother and, you know, when you have family, it's so much... E it's not that easy, but it was so much easier. And when we got approved for our visa, you know, we left everything that we had in Kenya and we went to Australia and we landed in Adelaide and we started our new life there. And you were reunited. <laughs> yes, we were with my older sister who I hadn't seen for a few years as she went to Australia a few years before us and she, you know, she's like my best friend and, and all my other family that was in Australia before us and yes. See, I, ha I have friends who, who, who were refugee children who ended up in a completely different culture from the one that they were familiar with. <laughs> And it was an incredibly disorienting, disorienting experience, which they've really spent the rest of their lives coping with. But I'm curious uh, uh, what your experience was landing in Australia, um, completely different from any, obviously, from anything you knew, where you had to acclimatize yourself to an a new education system, for example. Right. Right. I mean, when I was in Kakuma, you know, in Kenya, my mother could not afford. I wanted to go to school so bad, but my mother could not afford for me and my younger sister to go to school. She, you know, she had a lot of people to look after. My mom's a single mom, and she's been a single mom since, you know, I was a child. And um, so that was something I really wanted to do. So that was one of the things I was really excited about, going to Australia, because I had heard stories about, you know, education is free there. And I was like, yes get to go to school. So the first thing I wanted to do when I landed in Adelaide was enroll in school. And, you know, um, leaving everything I had behind in Kenya, like, I was mindful and um, open-minded about this new lifestyle that I'm about to start. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was Australia was going to be like or, you know, the opportunities it was going to give me. I didn't expect anything at all. I kind of just went with the flow and... Um, Australia was very, I adapted to Australia very quickly, and I think most children do adapt to new things very quickly, but um, Australia became home to me so quickly, um, went to school, loved school, never wanted to, I didn't want the weekend to come because I wanted to go to school every single day, um, meeting new people, I learned English so quickly, and I just, I don't know. I just were you super like tall? Were you, were, you, were you a super tall I seven was year old? actually very tall. Um, I think I stopped growing when I was like 14 because then my sleeping got messed up and my eating and everything. But I was a tall, lanky kind of weird. I don't really, t like, I'm only talkative when I'm comfortable around someone, but I'm very shy at first and I don't really like talking. So I just kind of sat in the corner minding my own business. And um, the idea of, I mean, I always had some sort of love and passion for 
fashion. Like I loved using, me and my older sister would take my auntie's makeup and start doing, you know, playing with it and our mom would get mad and whatnot. But so I was, always had that sort of connection with fashion. But the, you know, modeling came about when I started seeing people like Alec Wack and Naomi Campbell on, you know, on TVs. And then I would go print out their posters and I would post them on my wall. And I was like, I wanna be like them. I wanna do what they do. And then it really came about in year seven when I was this tall, lanky, skinny, I don't know, model figure. And my year seven teacher started telling me, you should be a model. And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool, I'm gonna be a model. <laughs> but I didn't really know anything about modeling. Um, I just, I guess I just liked the look of Naomi Campbell and I like, but I didn't really understand anything about modeling. Um, That's good, you saw yourself in fashion though, so right. you could imagine yourself actually doing it because... Yeah, that, I mean I loved clothes, I loved makeup, I loved anything, you know, I loved dressing up and I'd always take my sister's makeup and do it at school and then they would call my mom and tell my mom and I'd be like, no I didn't. <laughs> but, but if you had all this new opportunity, what, what did your mother want you to do? Uh, the biggest thing that my mother wanted me to do was to get an education, because that's something that she really wanted to do. And when we first moved to Australia, she told all of us, like, you know, she wants us to go to school and get an education degree and things like that, and she'll be a proud mom and all of that. So the biggest thing was education. And I wanted education for myself, not only for my mom, but also for myself. And that was what I went for, and I got my education. I graduated high school last year, and I made my mom proud, like I promised her. When I first moved to Australia, I promised my mom three things. I said, I'm gonna finish high school, I'm gonna buy you a car, and I'm gonna buy you a house. And those three things, I have achieved two of them, which is completing high school and buying my mom a car, and I'm currently in the process of trying to buy my mom a house. So. <laughs> All by the age of 18. <laughs> What car did you buy her? Hmm? What car did you buy her? Um, I got, so for the longest time, my mom was talking about how she wanted a Jeep. And then I was like, okay, it's going to be expensive. So I'm really going to have to save. And then in the end, she's like, you know what? I don't even want a Jeep anymore. They're like super expensive. And they, you know, she just had reasons as to why she didn't want it. So she wanted a, a Nissan, like the latest model of like a, gets a five-seater family car in this, and, and that's the one that I got her. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. How, how were you discovered then? You said you, were, you, 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 you became sort of fascinated by, by modeling. How, how were you actually discovered? Um, so I've actually been scouted at like shopping centers and airports and things like that, but how my first experience with modeling was, I had an auntie who did a bit of modeling and then she started designing some African fabric um, print clothes. And then she would have these mini shows in the city, Rundle Mall in Adelaide. And when I said I wanted to model after my year seven teacher had stressed it to me so much, I told my mom, she was like, you're 12. Like, well, what are you gonna do? You know, you're in year seven. And she was not with it, so try to convince her she didn't. So I tried to get my auntie to convince her and she was like, no, she's too young. But then, you know, when I, my auntie asked me to be in her show and I was like, yes, but you're gonna have to ask mom because she's not gonna be okay with it. So she asked mom, mom didn't think anything of it. She was like, oh, whatever, you know, cool. So I did the show and my first time walking on a runway, I just had this feeling like, this is it. Like, this is what I wanna do. Um, why? Why do you think? I don't know. I cannot <laughs> describe why, but I feel like maybe it was just in me that that modeling was something I wanted to do, and it's, I don't know. Like, I just fell in love instantly. It was like love at first sight. Went on the runway, and I was like, this is it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know anything about modeling, but this, I know that this is what I want to do. Do you think you said you were shy, but you think being on the runway allowed you to be a show-off? So you could become something else? I feel like when I'm on the runway, I'm a whole different person. I'm like, I'm not shy. Um, so yeah, maybe it's a way of showing up. I don't know. Because then that happened really quickly that you were taken to Paris right away. I mean, just like, talk about a fairy tale. I mean, that just hardly ever happens. So yeah. You didn't exactly have to kind of I mean, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see that coming at all. Um, I was in Melbourne doing a little run, you know, doing a Melbourne um, 
fashion week, I was in school, so it was so hard to convince my mom to let me take that one week off school, but she did, so I was in Melbourne doing shows. I get a call from my agent telling me, oh, you know, St. Laurent wants some headshots of you, and I was like, oh, okay, didn't think anything of it, I'm like, St. Laurent, you know, you know. Um, so <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know, what do they want? So I went in, I did the headshots, didn't think anything of it, went on about with my week, finished my shows, and then I, flo I flew back home to Adelaide. And I get a call two days later from my agent telling me, and he was speaking so fast, so I didn't understand him, and he was like, you might possibly be, be going to Paris this Friday. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. And he was, I missed the part where he said for Saint Laurent, but then I was like, oh, I'm going to Paris. Like, what am I going to Paris for exactly? So I called him back, and he was like, oh, it's for Saint Laurent. They want to go see you. And I was like, oh, okay, wow, it's crazy. My mom was actually, she went to Kenya, and then she arrived a day before I left. So I called her, and she was like, um, like, what about school and all of that? I'm like, mom, it's just for a couple of days. I promise I'll do my homework. Um, yes, I bet. <laughs> Um, so, two days later, I flew to Paris. I, you know, it was my first time flying out of Australia in a long time, so nobody had told me I had to wear, like, compression stockings or anything like that. So, I didn't move in the plane. My foot swelled up, actually, and it was pretty bad because I spent the first eight hours in Paris at the hospital. So, straight after, my, there's no shoe that was fitting my foot. I thought I was going to lose my foot. I was freaking out. It was very painful, and I really thought that they were going to cut me from the show. Because, you know, I was just going for a meeting. I braced myself that, okay, if they don't like me, they're not going to choose me, but at least I get a free trip to Paris, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I went, and every day I was going to St. Laurent to see them. I didn't hear anything about being confirmed or being denied, and... I just started getting very frustrated, and then my foot, I was like, they're definitely not gonna accept me. You know, my foot was like a size, one foot was a size 41, and the other was a 38. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> um, but it was painful, and it hurt, and every morning I would wake up crying, like, why, why me? Why is this happening at this time? And then the day of the show came, we're doing rehearsals. Originally, I was supposed to wear high heels, and I just couldn't do it, like, my foot was just, in so much pain, and that was it. Like, I, I was like, yeah, I just messed this up, you know, there's no way they're gonna use me now. F you know, a few hours before the show, they ended up changing the shoes to um, men tuxedo shoes. <laughs> and I got to walk my first ever St. Laurent show, and that's no, where I, it all started, really. I mean, I remember, I remember, I remember, your f I remember your debut, I remember every show you were in, and that hardly ever happens. And, and it just felt to me, as I said before, that the timing was so perfect. Were you conscious yourself from the, rea the way people reacted to you that you represented something new or, or something different in, in modeling and in fashion? that it happened so fast, people, it was like people had been waiting for you? Um, <laughs> I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean. Um, what do you think you represent now in, in, in modeling? When the fashion industry um, has been, you know, making this big point of becoming a much more diverse place mm -hmm. right across the board. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, do you feel that you're a part of that? Yes, I do, 100%. I, um, um, I'm so grateful that I have came into modeling at a time like this where I get to be a part of this positive impact and um, that's happening within the industry. And you know, I have not seen the I mean, I haven't been modeling for that long, but each year, like, the diversity and inclusivity gets better and better every year, and it's just, it's amazing to be a part of this sort of movement that's happening. Um, you know, I represent black girls, I represent refugees, I represent, um, you know, people who came from nothing and have made something out of themselves. I, I feel like I represent a lot of things and, um, you know, I sit here proudly today to, you know, knowing that I'm inspiring a lot of people and, you know, just like a how I looked up to people like a leg work for inspiration. Now I, you know, people look up to me for inspiration and I don't think there's no greater feeling in this world than that.
and you, and that doesn't that doesn't overwhelm you. You feel you feel you have a responsibility to to represent. Uh, I do get overwhelmed, like any human being does. But um, you know, I feel like I have this responsibility to represent. You know young girls and boys, you know, I don't only have girl, little girls that look up to me, but there's also boys who message me telling me that, you know, I inspire them and what I do, you know, and it's not just people who want to model, it's, you know, people message me telling me that I've inspired them to love their black skin and I inspire them to, you know, chase their dreams because I'm a big believer of dreams and um, I always... In every post, I always say, you know, if you have a dream, just go for it, because you'll never know. And, and, and what do you imagine will happen now? What would you like to come next? Um, I want this movement that is happening within the industry to, you know, get better and better, more diversity, more inclusivity, and I'm just... Really, really excited to see, you know, where we're going to head with this. Um, so far, we're doing a great job. I'm, you know, I like to acknowledge the industry for what <laughs> the, I don't know, the movement that's happening right now. Um, well, I'm going to look at my crystal ball, and I think at the British Fashion Awards next week, you're probably going to be model of the year. I, I don't know, fingers crossed. I mean, I just got... Best Australian model of the year. That's I'm not usually right, but I think I might be right this time. <laughs> I so thank you very much, Abby. It's you wonderful. So much. Thank you.